Uh, welcome everyone to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. We are just honored to have our Grand Round speaker today. Our Grand Round speaker is Dr. Susanna Stanway. Dr. Stanway is a consultant medical oncologist in the breast unit at Royal Marston NHS Foundation Trust. She's also the associate honorary Fac uh, she's also the Associate Honorary Faculty Institute of Cancer Research. She's a well acclaimed oncologist who is very passionate about this topic, and we are just honored to have her today. The topic today is very pertinent um, um, uh, to you guys, and that's cancer, country, cancer control in low and middle income countries and equity imperative. Thank you so much, Susanna, for taking our time from your busy schedule and um, giving us this talk. Well, thank you ever so much for inviting me to come and talk. It's a, it's a real honour um, to be surrounded by so many wonderful people. Thank you. So I would like to give this talk about cancer control in low and middle income countries. Um, I believe, as do many others, that it's an equity imperative, and I think it's really the most important part of cancer control now. I'm going to flick through my conflicts of interest just in the interest of transparency. I'd like to start by playing um, a short video from, which is freely available on YouTube um, about the case of Jessie, um, who has breast cancer in Uganda, because I think that this is a really, really powerful short film and it just sets the scene beautifully because she eloquently teases out some of the really important um, factors that I'm gonna then come on to later. So um, here we go. The doctor told me that this let remove your breast because there is cancer in your breast. I said, eh, I'm still young. How can I stay with that breast? I may look like somebody who is mad or what. Yeah. By that time, I start getting difficult life. Yeah. There is a word for cancer. Sometimes they call it a tree in natural language. The cancer nowadays is a big problem. Sometimes they just think maybe the effect of the war, they don't know. They think cancer can spread like malaria. If you live with someone who have cancer, if the mosquito bite you, they will spread for you cancer. People fear cancer better than AIDS. They told me that if you have it, at least you can get treatment for free. I live in Guru, northern part of Uganda. Guru is far, very, very, very far. I received my treatment in Kampala, in Lago Hospital. Sometimes I spend two months there without coming back because there is no drug in Gulu. And Mulago is a big, 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 big hospital. But sometimes you will find when there is no drug in Mulago.
those who have money can buy. Those who don't have money like me, I just live there in the veranda. I wait the government send the drug. Doctor told me that nothing he can do. That one is the work of the government. I asked the doctor, what is cancer? She told me that this is, if you treat highly, they will get cured. If you don't treat highly, then it's very, very dangerous. I think in two weeks, after bathing, I came back. Then I found something is out. It's very hard. I said, eh, what is that? This swelling. When I'm empty, I'm a tailor. I can make a dress, any fashion. When I came from hospital, I said, my husband, I have cancer now. Jesse, you said you have cancer. My husband asked me, do you think I can manage? Cancer is bad, 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 awfully. I don't think if I can manage. That is how we are not together. I have two children. Mm. I love to stay with them, thinking or praying. I love them so, so much. They ask me, Mama, why are you going every time up to Mulago. So I have to tell them. I have to go to Mulago to get proper treatment because I want to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> the cancer now, it can now affect me. Because if I see many people, is now okay. Some women, they don't have blood breath. They are now okay. I think I'm going to be among them. I can get a little drug so that I be at least not to be with that pain because I have pain. I think one time, one day, God will help me with my problem. I want to be alive. I don't want to die. I don't want to, to meet my suicide. I want to keep my children. I want my children to study if I am okay. But I know if God helps me, I will be okay. Yeah. So I think you all all agree that was a really powerful um, short film. Um, so it, it just leads into what I, I'd like to go on and talk about. So the outline of my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of global cancer, a tiny bit about the policy and the economics. Um, I'm going to, I, I treat breast cancer, I'm a breast cancer medical oncologist. I'm going to use breast cancer as a construct 
as an example of, of how to manage cancer. Um, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of how I've got involved um, just to show that you can be a busy oncologist and still um, do this kind of work if it's your interest and it's your passion um, and how I think um, things will move forward in this area. So my definition for global oncology is that it's evidence-based, accessible, cost-effective care across the continuum for all. That's the aim. It involves science, and the many disciplines of science and social science. This isn't a couple of people doing this, this is the whole gamut of people that we need. It involves policy, it involves advocacy, it involves civil society, it involves business. This is a fabulous letter to the New England Journal of Medicine that was written by Satish Gopal, who actually last week was made head of global oncology at the NCI. He was an oncologist working in Malawi, a country of 70 million people. And he was writing off the back of President Obama's 2016 State of the Union address where he was talking about cancer moonshots, all the money the US were gonna plow into cancer research, saying what wonderful advances we've seen, how many more people are now surviving cancer. And he says in this letter, hang on a minute, I, I, I work in Malawi, I'm not seeing any of these wonderful advances that you're seeing. Over half the women I see presenting with breast cancer have had symptoms for over a year because they're not aware of breast cancer as a concept. Cervical cancer is the leading cause of cancer in women, le leading cause of death of cancer in women. And yet we've had a vaccine for over 10 years. This is a preventable cancer. What's happening here? And then he goes on to say at the end that what ultimately transformed HIV in sub-Saharan Africa from an existential health threat to a prototypical global health success story was not just research, but it was broad civil society activism and political will. And then he finishes with these lovely words, shooting for the moon is important, but so is shooting for a world that is just and equitable. And we'll come back to a few of these points later. So there is an epidemiological transition going on in the world. If we look at this pie chart from 1990 and then compare it to 2011, slowly many countries are being lifted out of poverty. And of the world's 195 countries, actually now only 32 of them are classified as low income when you look at the World Bank definitions of um, income countries. So low income countries are those that earn where the GNI per capita is less than a thousand US dollars per year. Um, middle income follows that and then over 12,000 um, US dollars GNI per capita per year are high income countries. So examples of low income countries are Haiti, Afghanistan, um, middle income countries, for example, India, Thailand, high income countries, for example, um, Australia, the UK and the US. Different countries spend different amounts on healthcare, and this is important. So if we look at this map, the blue countries are high income countries where the average spent on healthcare is around 12.3% of GDP. And if you look at the dark red countries, which you can see are predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa, these countries spend around 4% of GDP on health. This is the Fragile States Index, um, which you can access online. Um, and this is just a map, just to show that it's not just whether countries are high, middle or low income, but there's also other factors which have to be taken into consideration, such as conflict. So if you think of the world's 7.6 billion people, over a billion people live in areas where there's conflict. And the average length of a protracted refugee state now is around 26 years. Um, there are 65 million internally displaced people um, at an international level. And you can only imagine that when you've got conflict featuring in trying to um, implement um, healthcare infrastructure, particularly for a complex disease like cancer, this is going to play a part. So non-communicable diseases account for 67% of deaths in lower middle income countries, but only 1% of health funding addresses them. So it's just interesting looking here at the, the death rate from TB, malaria and HIV, but actually there are more deaths that occur globally from cancer than this. And I think that health funding is going to have to shift in that direction such that things change pretty quickly. So the cancer epidemic, what kind of numbers are we talking here? So cancer is currently responsible for one in six deaths globally. 17 million new cases of cancer a year globally. 9.6 million deaths globally from cancer. 
And the majority of these deaths happen in low and middle income countries where there just isn't the infrastructure, the access to diagnosis and treatment that there is in high income settings. And furthermore, increasing incidence is outpacing improved cancer survival. So yes, research in high income countries is doing fabulous things and pushing this forward, but we have to also look at it from the other side um, and, and work out how we're going to make this equitable as a global level. So where are, all, where are the majority of these cancer cases? So you can see here from these pie charts, looking on the left incidence and the right mortality, that the majority of these deaths are happening in East Asia and, and the Pacific. So countries such as India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal. So these are some maps from IARC. It's Globacan, you can access them freely on, on, the, on the IARC website. A lot of the data on this website, or some of it, should I say, in some countries is modelled data. And that is because some low income settings just simply don't have the cancer intelligence systems in place that high income countries have, such as cancer registry. So they don't know what the nature of this problem is accurately. So this is looking at age standardised incident rates in 2018 for females of all ages. And you can see here that it's predominantly pink. So breast cancer is the number one cancer per incidence in most countries, with the exception of, uh, of a few countries, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, where cervical cancer, as I said before, a preventable cancer, is, is the leading cause of, of, of female cancer incidence. Um, then looking here, this looks at age standardized mortality for women, again from the IOC website. And you can see here that in high income countries, the highest mortality is from lung cancer. Again, a preventable cancer, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, and, but breast cancer is the number one from mortality perspective in many, many countries. And just moving quickly to males of all ages, this is incidence, and you can see here that in um, North America, for example, in Australasia, non melanomatous skin cancer is number one. Um, prostate cancer also very prevalent from an incidence perspective. And looking at mortality rates, lung cancer um, really is, is, is one of the, um, has the highest mortality rate. You can see here that there are some exceptions, such as India, where you've got oral cancers, and also in Mozambique, there you can see in pink, Carposi sarcoma. So, coming back to breast cancer, why are these incident rate, incidence rates going up? Well, th this is complex and there are multiple um, etiological factors. Um, we no doubt live in an aging population, so all countries are thankfully experiencing this. Um, change in lifestyle, factors of, uh, such as obesity, we'll come on to that in a minute, which we know increases breast cancer risk, changes in reproductive behavior, people are having, um, women are having children later. Population growth, rising awareness, so more people probably coming forward to be diagnosed, and also declines in death from infections related diseases, so people are living longer. But the mortality to incidence ratios have to be looked at and taken really, really seriously because it's a grave situation that your survival from cancer depends upon your country of birth. So you look at these, if you live in a low income country, you are more likely to die from breast cancer, cervical cancer, all of these cancers um, than if you live in a high income country. And this graph, um, th this map here again shows it for breast cancer. So you can see the dark um, blue, if you look at incidence rates and on the top, the, the highest incidence rates are at the countries in dark blue. So you can see predominantly high income countries have the highest incidence rates of breast cancer. But you look at the bottom map, um, you can see that the dark red, which is the highest mortality rates are happening here in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, where you haven't got the highest incidence rate. So there's a, there's a discrepancy here. So this is a, a, a Herculean effort, to a paper um, published in The Lancet in 2015 by Claudia Alamani, who is a epidemiologist at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. And this is the Concord II study. So she looked at analyses of individual data for over 25 million patients from 279 population-based registries. And you can see here the difference in survival from breast cancer in these 67 different countries. And in fact, even if you look across Europe, many of which are high income countries, there's a 20% difference in survival rates. So this does differ between countries. 
So if we're talking about global health and any disease, it's important to embed it within the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So these were started in 1972. Um, the Millennium Development Goals replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, which will take us up to um, 2030. These are 17 goals, 169 targets. And if you look, many of these, you can map cancer onto them and see how, um, how um, cancer is affected by it. So, for example, poverty. So we know that even within, say, a high income country, uh, all the work that Michael Marmot has done and, uh, and published on that, if you're poor, you're more likely to have a worse, um, a worse outcome from cancer. And the same goes between countries. Good health, I'm going to come on to in my next slide because that's incredibly important. Quality education, we need to do a, a big bit of work in educating people in low and middle income countries such that they are aware of cancer as a construct and that it doesn't necessarily mean death if they present with it to a hospital, which in many places is, is sadly the case. Um, gender equality, I shall come on to in a little bit because that's very, very important when we're talking about breast cancer. Um, sustainable cities, reduced inequalities, these are all relevant. Um, peace and justice, I would say that this is a human rights issue. Um, and 17, the partnership for the goals. So uh, I, I'm a medical oncologist and I collaborate with, with colleagues in low and middle income countries and we partner up and, and, and see how we can help each other. So coming to um, SDG number three, the good health, um, universal health coverage. So this, this is so important. So this is Dr. Tedros. He is an Ethiopian um, public health um, professional. He's current director general of the WHO. And I just love this statement and it's so true. Health is a political choice. Universal health coverage is the bedrock of sustainable development. And this is, this means everybody having access to health services. It means having financial protection if you get ill and it means equity in access. And just because you're not a high income country doesn't mean to say that this isn't possible because countries who are not high income countries have demonstrated that it is such as Thailand. But yet over half the countries in the world don't have access to UHC. So putting cancer on the global health and development agenda. So this it started a, a long way back. So 2011, there was a UN high level summit and adoption of UN political declaration on non-communicable diseases. And then many um, great meetings have been done with superb work since um, 2015, that sustainable development goal number three that I was telling you about. So by 2030, there is a mandate that there should be a reduction in a third of, of deaths from non-communicable diseases. Um, and everything that we know about UHC and how important that's going to be to, to cancer. And it's just really important that as, as different diseases that we don't work in a siloed way, that we, that we all work in an integrated way in a, in a diagonal fashion, because we're not going to be able to go into countries and sort out HIV or sort out, um, sort out TB. This is going to have to be done in a much better, um, within a much better infrastructure whereby we all work together. Um, and so when a woman, for example, is coming for her cervical smear or is coming for a, a baby check after she's given birth, it's, it, it's these opportune moments that we need to pounce upon and make sure at that point in time, for example, that she's aware of, of, of breast cancer and, and has breast awareness. Cancer policy is just so very important when, when talking about cancer on, on the global stage. So the myth is that cancer care is expensive, but act, the actual reality of it is that not having cancer control policies is more expensive for, for any government. And we need to make sure that we create the evidence so that this can be translated into policy, which is going to make survival changes. So for example, smoking, again here, there's huge disparities. So nearly 80% of the world's smokers live in low and middle income countries. And yet we know there is evidence showing that fiscal policies, so taxation reduces smoking, tobacco-free portfolios, so not allowing pension companies to invest in tobacco companies, and plain packaging all reduces smoking, which will have knock-on effects on, on, on lung cancer um, incidence and mortality. And I just put at the, at the bottom WHO best buys because these are a set of measures which are evidence based and proven and freely available for everybody on the on WHO website. 
So, you know, things like everybody should be vaccinated against their hepatitis B where, where appropriate to reduce the, the risk of liver cancer, for example. This is the Cancer Preparedness Index, which I just think is, is really exciting. Um, it's, it was set up by The Economist. It's 45 indicators um, across policy, infrastructure and, and, and intelligence. Um, and just rates countries based on how prepared they are basically for, for cancer and, and to manage it. So economics, it's not just the human cost of cancer that we have to consider, although that probably does come first, but the economic impact if we're wanting countries to treat it in an appropriate fashion. And you can just look here on this slide, the huge amount of money that treating cancer costs a country. But as I said before, not treating it costs even more. This is a wonderful commission that was led by um, Freira Ginsburg, who is at um, the um, NYU in the US. And this tackles health equity in women's cancer. So women often fare particularly badly in these countries. Um, um, and this just shows how this is a challenge for everybody. And there are a series of interventions which are proposed to close the divide for women with breast and cervical cancer and how global policy um, can be changed. So manpower, I just put this slide in just to remind myself that this is also about building capacity. Um, so, and, and capacity, not just amongst medical nursing and health workers, but, but all kinds of workers that are needed to develop an infrastructure that's going to treat cancer. So technicians that are going to maintain ra radiotherapy machines, phlebotomists that are going to take blood, it, 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 the whole um, spectrum is needed here. We need to really think about how we avoid the brain drain of uh, amazing healthcare professionals from poorer settings where they may see a better quality of life in a higher income country. How can we empower them to, to deliver the care that they want to and that they're trained to do in their country? Um, and I've worked in Tanzania and, and, and in Kenya and I, I, I've been there when doctors haven't been paid for three months and you can just see the frustration that this must cause um, when all, all they want to do is their work that they're passionate about. We need to make sure that countries use the workforce they have. So what works in a high income country may not work in a low income country. You have to use what you've got available. And if this means other kinds of healthcare professionals, um, not doctors deliver, delivering care, then so be it. It doesn't mean to say it's going to be any worse. It's just different. Um, and we need to use innovative solutions. Um, so two of my colleagues in, in the UK, for example, um, Shafi Ahmed is a wonderful doctor. He's done TED Talks. He's really worth checking out. He, I went to a talk of his the other day and he was talking about, he's a surgeon, you know, how in the future he'll be sending his avatar to other countries to perform his operations. Just mind blowing things. Um, and Richard Sullivan, who's another colleague at King's has been working with um, the brilliant Gross Beck Parham in, in Zambia, looking at how they can use virtual reality to, to train surgeons in Zambia. Really, really interesting. So just coming back to breast cancer again, thinking about the cancer care continuum, starting at how we prevent cancer, how we screen for it so that we can detect it at an early stage when it's still curable, how we can diagnose it properly so that we know exactly what we're dealing with and what type of cancer, what subtype of cancer, and how we can treat it properly. So managing cancer isn't just about treatment. Actually, I would say that's certainly not at the top of the list. This whole continuum is important. Um, as is survivorship care, making sure that you look after your patients once you've given them potentially toxic drugs or perform disfiguring surgery. And I would say palliative care, so, so, so important, and we'll come on to that shortly. So prevention. Um, I've put here obesity. So this is just an example, a horrible statistic for every one US dollar spent on promoting healthy eating, 500 US dollars are spent on promoting processed unhealthy foods. What an awful thing to think about. So much data blinking obesity with increased risk of getting breast cancer and worse outcomes after you've been diagnosed with breast cancer as well. And how important it is that we as a global health community um, make sure that we've got evidence to inform policy to, to protect humanity from, from these um, epidemics. I just put this down as well. Clearly breastfeeding is not going to be the panacea to cure breast cancer, but I think small incremental improvements in preventing diseases like breast cancer of which breastfeeding is one of them has to be considered so this is actually a book that my mum wrote just after she had me she used to travel to countries advocating about the importance of breast cancer including low resource settings 
So breast cancer protects against luminal and triple negative um, breast cancer. You get lactation-induced amenorrhea, which causes a reduction in time exposed to sex hormones, and it causes a permanent alteration in breast histology. Um, so I have to say that I always used to think that breastfeeding probably just reduced hormone receptor positive breast cancer. But as you can see from these forest plots here, it actually reduces all subtypes of breast cancer. Um, and again, it's free um, and, and, and simple to empower women to do. Early detection and treatment is so, so, so important because in low and middle income countries, more than 50% of cancer often presents in an advanced setting. And not only is this more expensive for a country to then treat, but it has a worse outcome for the patient and their family. So that this must be a driver to create improved um, understanding of cancer and improved diagnostic services and, uh, and also shortening the time it takes to get diagnosed. Um, it was really heartbreaking um, working in Nairobi and hearing some of the women's stories where they'd been referred to tertiary um, centres sort of six, seven months ago, and, and it had taken that long to be seen, by which time sometimes the disease has become metastatic and is then sadly incurable. So screening may not be, this is a little bit back to that one, the one size doesn't fit all. You know, in the high income countries, we have mammographic screening programmes and, it, you know, the, uh, the benefit that those cause um, caused is even deb debatable in high income countries. And so certainly it's probably not going to be um, not going to be sensible to do it in a low resource setting, but there are other ways of screening for cancer, um, self-examination, um, teaching women to be breast aware. And there are studies that have been done on these, some of which have shown them to be successful. So not only are the, is the infrastructure not the same around the world, but also the biology of cancer is not the same. So we know from studies in African-American women in the US, for example, um, that if they have hormone receptor breast, positive breast cancer, it has a worse outcome than Caucasian women. We know that in sub-Saharan Africa, a greater percentage of breast cancer is triple negative breast cancer, which has a worse outcome. We know that the founder mutations for um, for um, BRCA mutations are different around the world. And just looking at these breast cancer statistics, so where I work in the UK, less than 10% of breast cancers present in women under 44. But in low and middle income countries, women present at a much earlier age just because of the population pyramid. So if you think that the average or the median age in a country like the Democratic Republic of Congo is around 18. And in Japan, the median age of the population is 48. You can see that just the whole population generally is going to be younger in a country like DRC. And so therefore more women are going to present at a younger age with breast cancer. And there are huge challenges that face young women with breast cancer. This is a particular interest of mine. And we've set up a special um, um, pathway um, to, to navigate this at the hospital that I work in. So it's a particular interest of mine, but young women with breast cancer tend to present later. It's harder to detect on mammograms because they have denser breasts, harder to pick up. They tend to be referred later because primary care tend to think it might be an abscess or you know, you're too young to have breast cancer. The biology is different, more likely to have aggressive subtypes, worse toxicity from endocrine treatment, and the list goes on. So it's, 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 a, it's often a much worse experience for young women. Diagnostics, histopathology. I think with this slide, I would just say, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. So whilst we should be striving everywhere for excellence, we should be striving to do all of the analyses that we would want to do on a cancer biopsy in a high income country. I'm just concerned that somebody is biopsied and that we, we prove it's cancer, even if we can't do everything else just prove it's breast cancer. And really you should also be doing hormone receptors because the majority of breast cancer is hormone receptor positive and that alters how we treat it. But, but don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. We, in some settings, we just want a biopsy. Radiology, please use the um, appropriate tool in the appropriate situation. Um, I think that there's a, a, a knee jerk in, in some countries where, where patients have to pay for all of their care. Um, to maybe do the most expensive um, radiological examination, for example, starting out with a PET scan, which may not be necessary. And often in these countries, a cancer diagnosis means that a patient risks financial catastrophe. That is not uncommon. And we want to really mitigate against that. 
So looking at treatment. Um, surgery, so important. So surgeons are probably the most important people when you look at um, people presenting with cancer, particularly at an early stage. So 25% um, of patients worldwide get access to safe, affordable or timely surgery. This clearly needs to be improved upon. So of the new cancer cases in 2015, I haven't updated that stat, sorry, it's 15.2 million then, over 80% require surgery. This is so important. And so the WHO has adopted a resolution to strengthen emergency surgery and essential surgical care. And this is just the graph which just shows the, the economic effect, so important to demonstrate this, the economic effect of not investing in cancer surgery. It costs countries. We must be investing in this. This was... Um, and, uh, a doctor from sub-Saharan Africa that I had the pleasure of sitting um, next to um, at a conference once and he just said that women are afraid that if they go to hospital with their suspected breast cancer they'll have their breast cut off. So we need to ensure that um, so that women aren't forced to have mastectomies in, this, in these countries because there aren't the other associated adjuvant treatments which mean that mastectomy isn't the only option, that there is access to radiotherapy because we know that a wide local excision plus radiotherapy in a cancer that's small enough to be operable is the same as someone who's had, a, a, and the outcome will be the same as a mastectomy. We need to ensure that people are presenting early and we need to ensure that in these settings there's training for surgeons to, have, to, to be able to give reconstructive surgery so that these women aren't disfigured and the thought of that stops them presenting in the first place, which is a travesty. Radiotherapy is so important. It's an essential treatment for 50% of cancer patients and yet global access is woefully inadequate. And often you hear about radiotherapy machines being delivered from high income countries and being given to um, countries, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, but th then there isn't th um, thought perhaps given to how these are going to be maintained, how, how the radiation is going to be um, discarded safely. Um, so this all needs to be needs to be thought about and the and global task force have been um, set up um, to address this. And I'm really, really excited, as I'm sure many people are, to see that global oncology is the theme of ASTRO, the American Society of, of Radiation Oncology this year, which is just brilliant. So it's really putting this on the on, on the global health map. I just put this down because I also think it's really important in high income countries that we continue doing studies to show the non inferiority of treatment minimization. So this is a study um, led by one of the professors in, in my hospital just showing that you can give less fractions of radiotherapy and have the same outcome after someone's had a diagnosis of breast cancer. So important. And systemic therapies. So the WHO has an essential medicines list, the latest list in 2019. It's got 46 drugs on it and many of these are pertinent to cancer. And these are drugs that all governments should be making available to their people. This is um, just different subtypes of breast cancer. You can see here the majority is hormone receptor positive. We know that there are benefits in some cases from adjuvant chemotherapy and an adjuvant endocrine therapy as demonstrated by big um, international randomized control trials. So where possible, we should ensure that women have access to this. Um, aromatase inhibitors are a type of hormone therapy that are a little superior to tamoxifen, but more expensive. Tamoxifen is probably one of the best cancer drugs ever invented. It costs pennies. Um, so please, if, if cost is a consideration and you haven't got access to aromatase inhibitors, again, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. Tamoxifen is a wonderful drug. And this is just steps to improve access to systemic therapy, the use of ge generic drugs and biosimilars. So some of this is slightly controversial. Compulsory licensing, um, price discrimination. Um, you know, if you go to Somalia and buy a Big Mac, it's going to cost a, a different amount of money to me buying a Big Mac in London. So why shouldn't drugs be, so be sold by pharmaceutical companies at different rates to different countries for equity of access? And like the HIV community, we need to harness global mechanisms for pricing and financing and drug procurement so that we work as a global community for the benefit of cancer patients around the world and stand up and be their advocates. This was a plenary session at ASCO, the world's um, biggest cancer conference held in America every year, just showing that biosimilar trastuzumab is just as good as, as, as normal trastuzumab or Herceptin. This is a monoclonal antibody that's used for the treatment of HER2 positive breast cancer. And palliative care, as I said before, so important. 20 million people a year need access to palliative care. 80% of these are in low and middle income countries. Um, 
and yet 32 percent of people have no access to palliative care at all and are, are, are dying and, and suffering and if you think of a country like india which hosts around 17.4 percent of the world's population and you look at the consumption of opioids for end-of-life care um, uh, compared to other countries it's woefully inadequate and this just simply is not is not fair and the role of civil society is so important so culturally appropriate messaging created by those who understand the culture um, what the people of the UK will understand and want to hear is going to be different to colleagues that, that I work with and how they get their message out in Ghana or, or in, in, in Tanzania or, or in, in Mexico or in, in the Middle East. It's different and we must make sure that this is culturally appropriate, that stigma is dispelled um, and that myths are, are got rid of. Research is so important to push things forward. We need to show that what we're doing is evidence based in whatever country that we're doing it in but yet only 4% of global research and development is applicable to low resource settings. 0.1% of breast cancer research globally comes from low and middle income countries. This is um, an article looking at whether guidelines developed in high income countries are applicable to low and middle income countries. And of course they're often not. And this is a wonderful initiative that was led by Ben Anderson um, in, in the US. And he, he, what he's done is he's resource stratified guidelines so that patients get access to um, evidence-based guidelines depending on, um, on the financing that's available in that country is such a great idea. These are a few of the projects that I've been um, involved with over the last couple of years. I've um, joined a couple of years ago the Editorial Board of ASCO's Journal of Global Oncology. Um, I've worked in um, Tanzania and in Kenya with the East African Development Bank and the Royal College of Physicians and the British Council with a wonderful faculty over there um, just helping with oncology um, teaching. Um, and I've had some research um, projects of working with some wonderful people in Ghana and more recently in, in, in DRC. Um, and I've, I've also set up an annual meeting in this country because I, I think that as well as working with colleagues abroad, it's really important to put it on the agenda in your own country and try and um, inspire and empower other colleagues um, to, to do some global health work as well. So these are a few of the things that I've learned with um, international oncology collaboration. Of course, there must be mutual respect and, the, and, and there definitely is in my case. Um, relationships take time to build and, and, and it is about building relationships. It's not about helicoptering and doing some work with some colleagues and then leaving. This is a, an ongoing commitment. There's reciprocal learning. I've learned huge amounts from going to work in, our, in other countries. Um, really, really have. I've been totally stunned by the quality of, of, of medical education and of um, examination skills, which way eclipse mine in many of these settings. Um, and, and the work you do must be sustainable. Um, it must continue when you've gone and, and should be coordinated. And again, these, these are just a couple of studies that, that, that I've been involved with. Um, the, the first is just looking at what breast cancer um, um, patients or survivors needs are after treatment with breast cancer in, in, in a couple of sub-Saharan African countries and then how we can um, how we can work with, with, with nurses and healthcare professionals to develop the skills to support these women off after their diagnosis and treatment. And um, I've recently started working with, with um, the wonderful Nono Okumbe in, in DRC um, on a palliative care project. So he's one of, I believe, five oncologists for the whole country. Um, and so we've decided to start with palliative care, which is so important. Um, we just had the green light at, at my cancer hospital and the Institute of Cancer Research to set up a global oncology centre last week, which is really, really exciting. So we're looking for some international collaborators. And this is going to hopefully include advocacy, research, um, which are, I'm really interested in implementation sites. I, I think that's really important. And also education. Um, this is a, a week which um, I co-lead that we set up for the first time last year. We've called it London Global Cancer Week. Um, this year it will be over 20 meetings. We've got input from the Commonwealth, um, from the WHO, from, from UICC, and it's just a really exciting week. I hope that many of you will join. Um, um, all of the talks are going to be um, online. Most of them are free, um, and it just should be really um, a really, really exciting and inspiring week, I hope. 
Um, and as a result of that week, I've just had a call from my colleagues in this country to try and set up a UK global oncology network because many, particularly the, the junior doctors and medical students, are just desperate to get involved. I, I suppose a little bit like I was, but just didn't quite know how to break in and how to make um, networks and how to collaborate with people in other countries. But they're really, really keen and um, their degree of commitment is huge. So I just want to finish um, with these five action points, which I've taken from the World Oncology Forum 2017, just because I think that they sum up the salient features really, really well. I think what we need in the, 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 within the global cancer community is a, is a clear narrative with hope and a clear mission, a little bit like the HIV community had many years ago. We need to create a diverse, inclusive social movement emphasizing a broadly based stakeholder coalition of partnerships and networks. We must make sure that there's additional sustainable financing from international but also from domestic sources. I don't think aid is going to be the answer here. It's, it's just not the answer. It needs to also come from within these countries and that's been shown to be possible in, in many low and middle income countries. There needs to be advance in, advances in research and development and innovation to translate these global ambitions and shared priorities to, to local solutions um, that work. And there needs to be a stronger alignment with global goals and initiatives embedded within the Sustainable Development Goals and the, and the UHC movement. I really like this um, Mandarin collection of symbols. On the left, we have Wei, and on the right, we have Xi. So this is the symbols for crisis. Wei means danger, and Xi means opportunity. I think there is huge danger that if we don't act soon and act now, that this is going to, the situation is only going to get worse. But I also think that there's huge opportunity, opportunity for innovation and to get really passionate people involved um, to make this all um, improve. I'd like to finish with the words of Satish Gopal from his New England Journal of Medicine letter in 2016. Shooting for the moon is important, but so is shooting for a world that is just and equitable. Um, uh, and I've just put a few sort of ideas for further reading and resources here. I, I really apologise. I, I pinched this from a talk that I gave to some students um, at my hospital last week, and it's quite UK focused. So when I put down here annual conferences, of course, my colleagues in India have their own annual conferences, as do my colleagues in Mexico and, and, and around the world. But this was um, sort of for UK colleagues, but some of it's relevant. So I've kept it up and I, I hope that's OK. Thank you so much for listening. It's, it's been really, really interesting to, to talk to with everyone. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sanway. Um, Let's see, Yinka, do we have any questions here in the Q&A box? Um, yes, we do. Thank you so much, Dr. Stanway. Um, we have a question from um, Enrique. He says, the lung cancer is the most common in the world. What do you think about the screening to the population? What, what do I think about, sorry, I missed the last bit. He, he said, lung cancer is the most common in the world. What do you think about the screening? The screening, yes. Well, I mean, I mean, there is evidence coming out that in high risk populations, there I'm sure will be a role for, say, low resolution CT. It's not my area of expertise, but I'm sure I'm sure that that's going to come because sadly, most people with lung cancer present at a stage in which it's incurable. Um, so, Chris Wilde was the ex IARC. Um, president and he said that we are not going to be able to treat our way out of cancer and I think that those are wise words. I think that we need to be thinking at the beginning of that cancer care continuum. We need to be thinking about prevention and early diagnosis and that's really what I think what the focus should be. So I think that's an excellent question and I think definitely yes. I think we need to be putting better fiscal policies in place such that people in low and middle income countries are protected from tobacco companies. Um, and other measures, plain packaging, as I said before, um, lap ban on advertising. But I also think that there's definitely going to be a role for screening of that, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you for that response, Dr. Stanway. We have another question. How do we collaborate with you and your team? Um, so I think 
what would be brilliant, I think, going forward is going to be feeding into this UK network that we're just establishing, because this is a network that we're establishing with many different types of healthcare professional. So nurses, hope, hopefully policymakers, and we've invited 22 um, founding members. We've had three meetings so far, um, paediatric oncologists, many of whom are doing this kind of work. And my hope for and mission for the future is that a little bit like the NCI have, so if you Google global oncology, I think the NCI's map is what comes up at the top. Um, it, to have this kind of network that whereby we can all link in, it's an interactive map, we can see who's working in our country, who we can link in with, who we can share experiences with, and, I, and I'm hoping that this will be bi-directional and, and go both ways. Um, it will be fantastic one day maybe if we can link up with the NCI map, who knows, I don't know, but um, Satish Gopal we've invited to speak at London Global Cancer Week, I think he's speaking at the end of the week, so that's certainly going to be one of my questions. Awesome, but, thank but, you. But feel free to, to, to email me, That I, I would love that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question is how do we reduce the pain um, for, breast, for breast cancer? Um, following radiation therapy? Or well, how do we reduce the pain? Yes. Mm. Um, so I suppose with adequate supportive care, so the correct use of the creams that have been prescribed, um, you know, fractionation being given in the correct way. Um, I ha in, in my practice, I, I have to say I don't seem to have, uh, I'm, I'm not a radiation oncologist, I have to say, um, I don't seem to see huge numbers of women coming forward on radiotherapy with that as their main complaint, but obviously it does happen. Um, yeah, whoever that question is, maybe if they want to email me and I can email one of my, one of my academic clinical oncology colleagues and do my best to answer that a little bit better. Okay. That would be great, thank you. Those are all the questions we have in the question and answer box. Um, yeah, I could I could ask one. So I, th I think um, at least here in the United States, we hear about a lot of the organizations involved in combating uh, infectious diseases like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, but do those foundations um, have the non-communicable diseases uh, garnered any interest from large organizations like that? So I think Gates is predominantly infection focused, but actually, in, very interestingly, Susan Hellman Desmond, who's the chief exec of Gates, is an ex-breast cancer oncologist. Okay. Um, so they do treat some cancers, but I think, I, from my understanding, they're predominantly interested in the cancers that are linked to infection, of which, in some of these settings, about 20% of cancers are. So when you think about HPV, HBV, you know, EBV, etc. Right. Um, but I think there will be a shift away from um, communicable diseases to NCDs in some of these organizations over time, I would suspect, because these are now causing, as, as I showed you in my talk, such a high um, mortality and morbidity burden. So that would be my feeling that, that things are going to change and we're already seeing that, um, you know, in the WHO, et cetera. Um, obviously, in the middle of a coronavirus pandemic, communicable diseases are probably top of everybody's agenda. But, you know, even in the coronavirus pandemic that we're in, cancer doesn't go away. Right. right. You know, one woman dies globally from breast cancer every 74 seconds. This is, these are huge numbers. Hmm. Um, so... Yes, I think that the funding streams and the, you know, the, the, all these big organizations um, place on non-communicable diseases, we are seeing a shift in that. Got it. Thank you. Let's see. I think, do we have another question that came in? Um, uh, no, no new question. Let's see. Yeah, before we unmute the classroom, does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask? Give them just a second here. Okay. Please Good. feel free to email me directly or message on Twitter or, or you know, whatever your preferred mode of communication is. That's absolutely fine. Perfect. And then Yinka, can you unmute the classroom? Are you able to do that? 
Let's see, I can try. I think they're unmuted now. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you for the presentation. We don't have to talk on this end. Did they say they didn't have any other questions? No, we don't have questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, oh, we do have one more, I think, that came in. Yes. Uh, do we do you use the ultrasound scans? For diagnosing breast cancer? Uh, they weren't they didn't specify. Okay, so, so in breast cancer, we generally have triple assessment in this country. So, um, well, it's a combination of, of um, radiology. So usually women have a mammogram and an ultrasound, um, a tissue biopsy and a clinical examination. Um, and then if needed, women with high risk disease or sort of adverse biology, we go on and stage um, our, our, our ladies to make sure that they don't have distant metastatic disease. So we know what our treatment paradigm will be. So yes, we use ultrasound. Our ultrasound is a great tool. I think I have a question, Dr. Stanway. Mm. Um, in your presentation, you talked about a spectrum starting from prevention to, um, I think, uh, palliative, palliative care. Yes. In your experience, what would you say, I know it's difficult to pinpoint one of those stages to say is most important, but what would you say the focus, focus should be in low and middle income countries? Prevention, so, um, screening, or treatment, research? Yeah, I think it totally depends on where you're talking about. And I'm very conscious of the fact that I've perhaps sort of lumped all of low and middle income countries in one box where that's clearly not applicable. So when I'm working with my colleagues in DRC, it's totally different to um, friends of mine that work in India and even in different areas of India, um, things are totally different. So um, these are very, very different settings. So, you know, the, the colleague that I'm working with in DRC, for example, he's the only oncologist out of the capital. And so and, and setting up a brand new hospital. So he's probably not going to be in a position immediately where he can treat cancer. So that's why in our um, research program, we are starting um, looking at palliative care and how useful that could be. Um, but I think it's going to involve a multi pronged approach. Um, I have a particular interest in cancer survivorship, hence the projects in Ghana and Tanzania, because I, just, I, I don't think that as, on, on, as oncologists um, that we can um, that we can give these treatments and then not be there at the end to pick up the pieces afterwards. And I think that why shouldn't that be just as important in Africa as it is in my country? It is, of course, just as important. So we have to make sure that people have the skills. Um, but on the other hand, as, as I quoted Chris Wilde in my, in my previous statement, we can't treat our way out of the, the cancer epidemic. So prevention and early presentation are going to be so important. But I think that you, you have to have people on board in these cultural settings and the stigmas and the, the, the people's um, religious ideals. And, and we have to be respectful that these are very different in different countries. Um, and so um, in Ghana, we've been working, for example, with church leaders um, and trying to um, convene people in, in churches to try and get the message across about cancer. So I think that you have to work within the construct that you have in a particular country. One size doesn't fit all. But I think, you know, to deliver proper cancer care, um, the ideal is that the whole spectrum is considered. Awesome. Thank you so much for that response. I think that's, a, oh, well, there's a question here that says, should we not be paying more attention to preventing these diseases? Yes, I agree. And you, if one looks at cancer research funding and the, uh, the, the amount of money that goes into prevention compared to the amount of money that goes into developing new treatments, often by pharmaceutical industry, it's really, really shocking that it's just not seen as the interesting end of the spectrum of cancer care. And that, again, is wrong. And that needs to be somehow rejigged. Um, so yes, I would say prevention and early presentation um, 
you know, early diagnosis is so important and just creating that infrastructure within the constructs of universal health coverage um, so that you're not just treating cancer in a siloed fashion, but it's alongside other diseases. Thank you so much. I think that's about it for the questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Stanway, for the wonderful presentation. I was a bit touched at the beginning with the documentary. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was very touching. That. That's fine, it was very touching, and um, I, I believe it just um, sheds more light on the importance of us understanding the impact of cancer in the world as a whole. So. And, and such a brave lady to, sh to share her story like that. Um, hopefully yes. for the benefit of others to inspire people to go out and try and change things. That's correct. Thank you so much for your time and for giving us this wonderful presentation. We thank the audience for being here as well, for listening and for asking questions. We hope all your questions were answered. Please feel free to contact Dr. Stanway um, via email or on Twitter. I think I saw your Twitter handle somewhere. And then um, she'll be yeah. happy to respond to the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for your interesting questions. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Be safe out there. Yes, you too. You all too.